everybody good morning uh, we still have a couple people coming in but we're gonna go ahead and get started we are expecting to take the two hours today the full two hours just because of the discussion uh, and the topics that we have for the day my name is Rob Dietrich I am the home base manager I am glad to be here uh, we do have link for specific slides the home base slides they will come up momentarily I'm going to take just a little bit of time to do an opening session this morning and we'll get right into it. This is the WebEx slide that we typically do just to make sure you are familiar with WebEx. We have captions there on the left. If you have questions, <coughs> excuse me, if you have questions, you can put them in QA that only we can see them. If you put them in the chat, everyone can see them. You have the mute, start video, share, and those other buttons there at the bottom of the screen. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to give you a quick home base overview. This will not take long. Just want to let you know the products in case you are new to PowerSchool. We are the definitive seamless go-to digital resource for North Carolina. And those are all the products that we have in the system. We have the student information system, which is PowerSchool, which is why we are here today. SchoolNet is our instructional improvement system. Canvas is our learning management system. GoOpenNC is our open education resource. We have Nesis a digital literacy program in learning.com and a supplemental math program through convenience contract with Imagine Math. Next slide, please. Everyone knows that the home base purpose here is to foster productive relationships. We're here to elicit feedback from you. We want, to me, this is some of the most important meetings we do every year because we get to hear from you and how well things are going and things that we need to improve on. Next slide. There is the schedule. We have another uh, meetup today at one with learning.com. And on Thursday, we have Canvas. And on Friday, we have Go Open. And please get the links there to register if you would like, as well as if you register at those links, you can get access to all of the recordings by Friday. Next slide, please. There is our schedule. What you will notice is that we are still have west to east, east to west, and west to east in September, November, and May. And that's simply due to the fact that we are looking for locations. In fact, we are not lo only looking for locations for the home-based meetups. We are also looking for digital teaching and learning. They want to do a reconnect um, event in September, and we are looking for locations for that as well. On the upper right of the opening slides where it says we are still looking for locations for face to face. If you click on that, that is a link and it will take you to information and what we need when we come to locations. We would like to get out and see everybody. I think that's a very extremely valuable part to the jobs that we have. So we are trying desperately to find locations. If you would like to house us, please uh, let us know by filling out a form that is on the bottom of that page and we will be happy to try to set something up and get this information out to people so that they can begin to make arrangements. Next slide. This is where all the slide decks will be. The PowerSchool slide deck will be posted after today. Next slide. I wanna give just a couple of quick home base updates. There's our social media. This is every call sign we have, everything we want you to know. And what we've added this year, if you go down to that link that says on YouTube home base overview and you click on that link, it will actually take you to an overview home base video that the home base team created. And it really explains a day in the life of a student through home base from enrolling to the end outcome of their day. That is something we encourage you to share with your people so that they understand everything that is involved in what we do. Next slide. As everyone on this call is probably aware of, there is a SIS upgrade August 6th through the 9th where we'll be going to version 20.11.3. I do want to explain the reason for that date is because it was far enough away from the opening of traditional schools that we felt uh, it would have minimal impact on making sure that this, the schools open correctly. We also want to remind you that Canvas Studio is now an option at a dollar per user. That is a video engagement um, tool that is in Canvas that I believe is very helpful. And then if you are interested in piloting Transcend, we are still possibly looking for people to do that. So please reach out to myself or John Mars for that. We also have a Nesis new principal pilot rubric that is underway and we will keep you posted on that. Uh, unfortunately, we have had someone leave the home base team and that's Pam Batchelor is leaving us. 
uh, to new wonderful grounds. So if you are interested in working in with home base, uh, we will have that job posted soon and we will please be on the lookout for that. So you could come join our team here at DPI. Next slide. There is a home base survey out there. Um, oddly enough, since home base has been in existence, there has never really been a survey done to measure how well we are doing with the products. If you would, please, please click on the link below and take five minutes of your day to fill out the survey. It will only ask you questions based on the programs that you use. It is not an all encompassing survey. We tried to shorten it and keep it straight into the point so that you can tell us how we are doing. Um, next slide. This is the great team that we have that has been working really hard to make sure that you get the resources that you need. And we have a feedback form there that you can fill out once all of this um, event is over today. I do also want to say before I turn it over to Justin and John, Tessa and Russell, I would like to say before we get started, I would like to say thank you to all of you for your patience over the EOI process. I understand that it was not as smooth as it needed to be. I understand that we have some work to do there, but I do appreciate your patience that day. I thank you for um, understanding the situation we were in and waiting for some of the power school processes to complete. So I hope I'm always about improvement and making next year better than this year. So we hope that next year will be better. Uh, and with that, I will now turn it over to Justin, who will walk us through everything going on with the student information system. Thank you very much and everyone have a great day. All right, thank you, Rob. Um, there's the link. If, if you would grab that link so that you can follow along with us. I think it's been dropped in the chat several times. All right, so our agenda today, we're going to start off with a special recognition and then I'll go over some SIS updates. Um, Rob's going to talk to you a little bit about third party integrations and then we're going to jump straight into the upgrade and do some demoing. Um, and that'll be John, Tessa, and Russell. And then we're going to wrap up. Um, sharing some news about a fall conference that we're planning. Next slide. All right, so the special recognition, huge shout out to Mark Southern, who last week at the EDGE conference won the Power School Innovator of the Year Award. Um, most of you know Rob, uh, very involved, not Rob, Mark. He's very involved in the Google group, always willing to lend a helping hand. And I know I've said this several times, but Mark and I go way back to when I was a coordinator at Rutherford County Schools. I could pick up the phone and I know he'd be there to help me with whatever I needed. Um, and even today, I still rely a lot on Mark. So congratulations, Mark. Um, if you guys would just reach out and congratulate him. Um, I do want to share that I think it's fantastic. This is the second year in a row that a North Carolina coordinator has won this international award. Last year, you guys know that Emily Jones receive this award. So I like that we're keeping it in North Carolina. Let's keep it going. All right, so there are the items that we're going to discuss for the SIS updates. Um, let's just jump on into the next slide, Tessa. Um, the GPAA, this is an item we've been working on for probably two years, and it's finally <laughs> in production, we think. Um, Tess is going to demo this. I know we've demoed it several times, but she's going to kind of go over where we are today and show you what to expect moving forward when you're entering historical grades. And note there, because we do get a lot of questions about QRDs, um, at the bottom of this first slide is a link to the historical grades QRD. There's not a QRD per se for just GPAA. Um, we just wrapped it into the historical grades QRD. All right, Tessa. All right, so I do have some slides just in case it didn't work properly um, that kind of explain it, but I'm gonna go ahead and demo it. Let me see if I can. Um, so I've got Mr. John Mars, and I'm gonna do single new entry. Oops, actually, let me go to the school level first.
All right, so everything is pretty much the same. I would just enter that. And this is going to base off of only the F1 store code. If you use any other code, um, it won't enter the earned credit and the GPA points and everything like that. It's only going to be on the F1 final store code. Um, so the course number is going to work just like when you're adding a course. Um, you will enter the course number and let's see if I can just grab one here and it'll automatically fill in the course name. Um, and then you would move down here. You can enter the teacher name. That's optional. That's not part of the GPAA though. Um, when you're entering the grade, it will pop up with a grade pop up that you can choose from. And once you enter that, it'll automatically enter all this information for you. Um, so GPA points, percent earned credit, potential credit. Um, these fields are actually supposed to be locked down. So let me, I actually have a slide, I believe. That shows you see how these fields are grayed out. I think Lorenzo's working on it because we had a few fixes, last minute fixes, so it's not going to function properly right now. But when you enter the grade and you select the grade, it'll automatically populate all of these fields for you right here, along with the percent. But these fields cannot be modified. Um, you won't be able to go in and update those. And then there's a few things that I do want to show you. So typically you would enter the credit type in here, but if you do have a transfer record and you need to enter something outside of the North Carolina um, standard, you would enter TR comma, and that would then unlock these fields for you. Um, obviously right now they're unlocked and they shouldn't be, but these would be unlocked so you can modify them. Um, and then if you do remove that TR code after making modifications, so if I did this, give it two credits, and then I remove this TR code and click away, it should give you a message and clear everything. <laughs> um, but again, I think Lorenzo's working on it now. Uh, let's see. Oops, sorry, I went too far. Um, and then also, if you were to, to change the course number, if you were to modify that after you had already entered everything, okay, it does give me that one. It says, please select a course from the menu, and then it clears all that information out. That's to ensure that you don't have the wrong information added to the wrong course. Um, so you can then go back and add in another course. And this only pertains to high school courses with um, an earned credit or a potential credit hour. I think it's an earned credit hour. If you were to enter a middle school course code or an elementary school course code, you would then be able to enter an A or a B. Um, and I do have a slide for that as well. So you see this is a middle school course number. So these fields are all unlocked. Um, and I'll go ahead and I don't know if it's going to show it, but I'll enter the course 1026. Um, and then you can enter an A grade and it's no problem. You don't really get the drop down. If you enter a numeric value, though, it does give you the drop down. But you see it doesn't fill in the GPA points or or any of the earned credit because it's a middle school course, not for credit. Um, and that. Um, and there are, so we do have a few things that we want to share. We are working with Lorenzo with a few last minute updates on this that we we did find some issues with. Um, so currently it is pulling from the grade scale within your local instance. And that grade scale must say, let me see, let me pull this screen over here. It must say NC 10 point scale. That name can only be this exact name no more, no less, or it will not work correctly within your instance. Um, we are hoping to get that updated to where we have the grade scale stored in the enterprise controller, and it is pulling only from the grade scale in the enterprise controller, um, but that's a little more work in the future that has to be done on it. So if it's not working in your instance currently, check your 10 point grade scale, your alpha 10 point grade scale, and make sure that it says NC space 10 dash point scale. All right, and do we have any questions? Yeah, we've got a few. Um, the first one can't enter alpha P mark. 
I think you brought that up this morning, Tessa. Yes, you can. If your special code scale is attached to your NC 10 point scale, you can enter those special codes. So you can enter the P's and the F's in the um, credit demonstrated mastery and all that. Um, let me I'll see if I can. Oops, that's probably not a good one. Um, well, it's not it's not working correctly because I think Lorenzo's working on it. Um, but you should be able to enter anything anything from your special code scale that's attached to your NC ten point scale should also populate there. Okay. Let's see. Will this affect high school credit courses taken at the middle school level? Yes, as long as you use the right course code and not. As long as you're using the right course code that has the earned credit attached to it, um, it'll work with that. Otherwise, it'll unlock like it's a regular middle school course code. All right, somebody asked if this will correct. Is, he, is it the historical grades? So I do see a question. Um, will this correct previously entered manually manual historical grades? Um, this is only for, so if you were to go back to that grade and click on it to modify, this function would be there and available and help you update it, but it's not going to go back and modify any data that was already entered. It's from this point moving forward for any grades entered and and or modified. If we change the name of the grade scale, will it automatically change on all of the courses assigned to it? Or do we need to go in and update the grade scale associated with all of the courses? Um, so the only thing you have to do is go in to the grade scale and change the name, and that should not affect any of the grades you have stored or anything attached to it. You're just updating the name so that it works, so that GPAA functionality works correctly in your system. Yeah, so there's no need to create another grade scale, just modify that name. Right, so whatever 10 point grade skill you currently have attached, just make sure the name is this exact name. Uh, and hopefully in the future that won't be an issue. We can just have it pull from the enterprise controller, but currently if you want it to work properly, it needs to be this exact name. Can we put that, can you copy and paste that name in the chat? For those that are asking. Yep. So Onslow has fixed theirs. It's like Laura's still having an issue. The special codes is connected and it's still not populating. So Laura, you go ahead and put in a ticket. And that goes for the rest of you. If you change the grade scale name to what Tessa just dropped in the chat, if it's still not working, go ahead and log a ticket. But as she said, Lorenzo is still working on this. It was supposed to go out into production during EOI. And we found out yesterday that it wasn't out there yet. So Lorenzo pushed this last night and we knew there might be changes needed. Also, I'm I'm not sure if updating the grade scale name and submitting the page would be an immediate change for that functionality. I, I would suspect it would be, but I'm not sure. Um, so there may be a delay if you have to enter that name or update that name. Am I saying when they choose the special code of P, it changes to a zero? You, you, may need to make sure, you may need to make sure that your 10 point grade scale and your special code scale are set up correctly. Um, and this is another reason why we want to make sure that we get it set up so it pulls from the enterprise controller. That way it's pulling, we know it's pulling from the correct grade scale and special code setup. Um, but some of these could be user error where it's not set up correctly. So make sure you check that. And if it's still an issue, then submit it, submit a case. <clears throat> yep, so there's another question. If ours is labeled NC 10 point alpha, do we need to remove alpha? And that would be yes. It needs to be exactly what Tessa dropped in the chat. And this is just short term, like she said, hopefully we're going to get it to look at the enterprise controller and not your grade scale name. But if you want it working immediately, that that's how you can fix it. Can we get a QRD to ensure we have both the 10 point grade scale and the special code scale set up correctly? I think there's one out there. Somebody can grab it and drop it in the chat. But also, we're going to have that set up in the enterprise controller and it's going to pull from that. So this is only temporary. Um, somebody got the message that, where'd it go? Scale name must be unique 
that must mean you probably already have an NC 10 point scale out there. So if you do go, go modify the other one, add something to it so that this one will be the unique one. And I expect many of you guys have two NC 10 point scales because when we went through that mess a few years ago with the alphanumeric scale, I know a lot of you changed it and added alpha or numeric to differentiate. Um, so I see, if, let me clarify. The 10 point scale and special code scale that is gonna be set up on the enterprise controller is only going to be for the purposes of adding a grade, manually adding a historical grade for high school courses for the GPAA. Anything outside of that for like Power Teacher Pro or anything like that would come from your whatever grade skill you assign to that course within your instance. So it should not affect your standards grading or your middle school grading or any other courses or grading that's used for Power Teacher Pro or Enter that way. It's only for the manual historical entry of grades where the GPA functionality is. Um, I'm going to make an assumption here that there are some people on this call that might not even know what an enterprise controller is. Uh, Justin, would you mind explaining what that is or what that does or anyone else on this call for me from DPI? Sure, it's a very dangerous thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so at, at, at DPI, we've got, um, I mean, it looks just like you, your instance where we can go in and modify things and set up certain things. And a lot of what you guys have in your instances are pushed down from the enterprise controller. So I would just go in and make some changes or update some things like special programs that we pushed out, the attendance codes that we changed over EOI. Um, it's just an instance that's set up to control some of the, the codes that you guys have. And another thing that's good to know is it updates four to five times a day. I don't, I don't remember the timing exactly, but if I were to go in right now and make a change in the enterprise controller, like for instance, if I wanted to push out a new special program, which I need to do, and I'll talk to you about that when we get to legislative class size, but if I were to push that out now, it wouldn't hit your instance until around noon today. So the changes aren't immediate. Um, yes, that's the screen I was about to ask you to go back to. Somebody's asking if they can still modify the attributes like class rank. Yeah, I saw exclude. That so GPA, have, GPAA functionality sure. only affects these fields right here um, and the store code. So if you were to change the store code, it would wipe everything out and you'd have to re-enter it. That's just to ensure that you're entering the correct information um, for whatever store code you change it to. But it only affects these fields. Everything else below that you will be able to modify on your own. Were you asking something, Justin? I think I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, you just covered it. Thank you. Oh, okay. And I think, and so in the slides, that's also covered. Um, I it shows only these fields that are affected. Too far. Any other questions? This is probably something you'd want to put a message out to your data managers today. Since this is the first day it's in production, they may not know what's going on. Um, if you want to share that QRD, it's been updated. You can share that along with a memo, letting them know that this is now in production. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions about the P, the alpha scale. Can you go, Tessa, and show them where that's attached? Um, it's right here. So if you're on the 10 point scale, if you're within that page where you edit it, it would be right here where you attach it. So if I'll go back to the grade scales. So you have all of your grade scales here and then you would have, it shows you over here, a special, whatever, whatever special code is attached to that. So here's the NC 10 point scale that it's using with the exact name that we dropped in the chat. And then here's the special codes for 10 point scale. So if I want to look at this special code scale, 
I would look for that name, which is right here. And if you want it to show up, use as a final grade needs to be checked off. Not sure why that wasn't checked for this one. Um, and then it should show up in the drop down. Um, that may or may not be working correctly. I think I looked at it in production earlier today and it was working. If you've got it set up just like this and it's still not working, I would advise you to go ahead and put in a ticket. And make sure it's the one that's attached to your courses. Make sure that's the one you are using. John, we've got a question about the standards import. We have an updated version out there, right? Is it complete yet? Um, so we have one with the exception of the social studies standards, which are not quite ready for release yet. Um, the rest of the subject areas that are out there should be up to date, though. All right, so we'll keep looking into this, specifically the the alpha grades. But if you have issues, go ahead and put in a ticket. And we'll discuss those with Power School later today. And John, if you can drop a link in there for Francine. Is that it, Tessa? That's it for GPAA. Next is transcript updates. All right. All right, so I'll take this one. Um, I've put a link in there for a, doc, a QRD that we've released a while back. It's been over a year um, for the TR in credit type. So for all the courses that are coming in outside of North Carolina public schools, you guys already know, and I've, I've done some spot check and, and I see that it's being used pretty regularly. For the credit type, you were to put in that TR code. Um, and this was a, an accountability need initially. But what we've done is we've taken, we had a request to flag these transfer courses on the transcript. So since the TR was already in use and you guys were doing that, then we are now flagging any of those transfer courses on the transcript. Um, and you'll see there, it's a blurry screenshot, but it's the best I could do. There's a T in the legend now so that folks who receive these transcripts know that the courses that are flagged with a T are courses that are um, received credit outside of North Carolina Public School. So that's now in production. That went, that went into production during EOI. Um, the one question I don't know yet, and I'm going to bring this up when I talk to Lorenzo, I'm not sure if this was written to flag new stored grades moving forward or historical. What I have found, um, I went into a couple of instances and I looked for stored grades that contain TR in the credit type, and I did not see those flagged appropriately on the transcript. So I'm going to ask Lorenzo if we can at least make that active or make this flag work for active students, not necessarily graduated students or transferred out, but I'm going to see if we can get this flag to populate on any student who's currently enrolled. But anyway, you'll notice that change on the transcript. Uh, and as we were reviewing this, I just wanted to point out I've looked at a lot of transcripts over the course of my years in education. And this was a huge flag that I think we should have added years ago just to understand what courses weren't taken in the district when you're looking at it, especially when you have kids transfer in who move a lot. Uh, we, we think this is gonna be a very good addition to the transcript. Legislative class size, before I get into the changes, I wanna share that because of the changes, um, we, we told you guys a while back that there were going to be monthly reports, unofficial reports that you could use. Um, we are still planning to roll those out, but um, with any change that has to go into code for the official reports, that means that those monthly reports also have to be updated. 
So it's kind of a heavy lift. So we're not going to push those out until we get the code change for the official reports complete. And the changes are on this screen. Um, I want to go ahead and let you guys know that this is the last year that the numbers are going to change. Well, until legislation changes again, but you guys know that every year the numbers have changed and this is the year where it, it goes into a freeze. So for 2021, so for fall and beyond, the spring report's going to be changed. And then moving forward, the reports are going to be the same. Um, your kindergarten numbers, your average for a whole PSU cannot exceed 18. And then your individual class max for kindergarten can't be over 21. First grade is 16 and 19. Second grade is 17 and 20. And so is third grade, 17 and 20. Um, so while the numbers are changing, the deadlines, the waiver and affidavit rules are going to remain the same. So the deadlines are still what they've always been. The affidavits and waivers must be submitted based on the, the rules that's already been in place. Um, over to the right, we shared this last year, but it's I don't think the word got out to everybody because we, we're getting a lot of tickets towards the end. But I think everybody's aware of the dual language immersion special program. Um, so if you've got dual language immersion sections, those need to be flagged and those are excluded from the class size numbers. Um, the one that was new last year that a lot of people didn't know about was the instructional pullout special program. This is to exclude any of those small two or three enrollment sections for pullout purposes or small EC classes. Those are not supposed to be counted in the class size report. So the easiest way we could exclude those was to put this special program out there. You guys go to the section setup page and in the program drop down, you can assign this NC instructional pullout program to that section and those numbers are automatically excluded. So notice those first two items have little X's beside them. That means that if any section has that program attached to it, those numbers are excluded altogether from the class size reports. The third one is the new one that I'm going to push out through the enterprise controller. You don't have that yet, but we had a lot of problems with combination classes not calculating correctly and reporting correctly on the legislative class size collection. So we're going to add another special program to identify sections that contain more than one grade level. So if you've got a kindergarten, first grade combo class, you will, once this is out there, you'll go to that section of each. Um, well, not of each because they're all together, but you'll flag it as an elementary combination class. And you'll only need to do this for the elementary classes. Um, I didn't want to put out there that it was for K-3 only because you might have a 3-4 combo class that could impact the K-3 average report. So for any elementary combination class, go ahead and assign this special program to that section. And I'm looking for this to be out there. I've got to get the exact code. And I want to point out one thing. Um, in the first two, you notice that it's NC hyphen, no spaces. Um, this is how all of the ones that we've pushed out have been. It's NC, no space, hyphen, no space. Um, and then the third one, you notice there's a space. And the reason there's a space there is because state compliance development team has already taken this and put it into code. So this is what they're looking to, um, this is what they're looking at when they go to look for these combo classes. So on this one, when I push it out, there will be a space. And that's why it's, it's just because it's already in development. If I go back and ask them to change it, then we're gonna be a month behind. So it's not a big deal, but I want you to know why that's different. Before I move on, let me look at these questions. Is there a cutoff number for a small? That's a good question. Um, and I'm going to say no. I think Sandy and Wake County asked me because, you know, in, in Rutherford County where I was, I would say three to four would be a small pullout. But in Wake County, you might have a dozen students. So for that, you're just going to have to decide locally what you consider a pullout section and flag it as such. Questions keep jumping around. Um, do the combos still need to be scheduled as the same teacher, same expression? Yes, that rule didn't change. I'm not sure what I, let's see. Does the special program exception need to be attached to the conduct code only 
or all codes attached to that section. I'm not sure what that means. What's conduct code? The only place you attach this special program, and I don't know if this answers your question or not, Michelle, is on the section setup page. There's a drop down that's just titled program. And that's where you'll assign whichever program. Yes, Mark, thank you. I, I thought I was right. There would be two different sections set up for combo classes. So both of those would need that combination class special program assigned. Instructions will be shared out, yes, Leslie. Once I get that special program out there. Oh, I got you, Ms. Michelle. That it would be for all. This was this is a new one. Pay attention to this. Um I don't think we did the best job, honestly, letting you guys know that the K eight numbers for the state or the school report card is now pulling from the legislative class size collection. That's why the K eight report is out there. You probably remember when we first rolled out the legislative class size collection, it was just the K-3 average and then your, um, whatever those two or three other small reports are. But then later, maybe last year, we added the K-8 report. And that's because this, this is for your review and that's what we're submitting over for the school report card. So, as you're reviewing your legislative class size reports, you probably want to get your superintendent involved or whoever else to review those K-8 numbers because those are just as important as your K-3 reports now. Um, what's this mean? I want to highlight that first bullet. All PSUs now must run the fall class size, or yeah, the fall. And the reason I say fall is because that's when we pull the K-8 numbers. The spring, even though the K-8 is in your list of reports, we're not pulling the K-8 school report card totals from the spring collection, we're pulling it from the fall. So this means charter schools now have to at least run the class size reports. Um, the K-3, all that good stuff, that, that doesn't matter for charter schools. But the reason I need you to run it is because unless you hit the, if you don't hit the run button, then the data doesn't flow to our ODS, which is where we pull the numbers. So we will work hard with the Office of Charter Schools to get this memo out so that all the charters know that they're now expected to at least run the report. You don't have to submit it, um, but as long as you hit the run button, we do have those numbers in the ODS. Um, again, make sure with your your folks at the county office that they know that the K-8 numbers are put, being pulled from this class size collection. So you want to be certain to review the K-8 numbers. And then the last item, is something you guys have been asking for for years, and I'm happy to share with you that the SAR is no longer needed and has been removed from PowerSchool. And there at the bottom, I did put a note because I had to ask yesterday, I wasn't sure where the 912 numbers were coming from for the school report card, and I was told that those were being provided by the accountability team at DPI. So the 912 numbers aren't being pulled from the class size collection. I know, Emily, the, the year you're leaving us is when we get rid of it. <laughs> um, Anita asked a question. Rob, I don't know how you want to respond to this one, but with the SAR being removed, are the course attributes still required? I believe they are required. We still pull from other things from what we have been told, so they are still required. If that changes, we'll let you know. Uh, there's a question about whether the report will now match on UID or is it still looking at social security number? Um, I don't remember if we got that change in place. I would say as of right now, it's still looking at social security number, but we are working to make that change. So we will look to try to do that as quickly as possible. Uh, Connie, if your charter is only 912, there's no need to run the report. Anybody see any other questions? Do high schools need to run legislative class size? Yes, unless you're a, a charter. If it's a charter school that's only high school grade levels, then there's no need. 912 numbers are being pulled from accountability. Um, and the reason you do have to run that report at the high school is because even though we've got the K-3 average reports and the K-8 for the report card, there's still are other reports like the, the overall 
I forget what the first one's called, just the class size report itself and the um, those special courses like dance, art, those things still need to be collected. So you do need to run them at the high school level. A couple of people are asking how do they search for missing attributes. Yes, sir, John, do you know right off? I'm not sure if you can do that in DDA. Uh, it's most likely in the extended table, so it's data export manager. I don't know them right off the top of my head. Um, but we, we probably need to find out what still uses those and then communicate yeah. out whether or not they still are required and if they are, how to find the missing ones. I agree. Yeah, let me put that out to, to DPI. There's so many different business owners. I'll, I'll get some feedback and find out which ones are needed and then let you guys know. We'll put out a list that, of what we know is required and then how to make sure they're populated. I think that's all the questions. All right. GDV, um, seems like this is an issue every year. And I was hoping this would be the year we finally got it right for you guys, but there is a known issue with the GDV2. Um, Power School is looking into this. The problem is, up until a couple of days ago, they only had like two or three cases. We saw a lot of emails in the Google group talking about the GDV not working. But then when we go to Power School, they'd say, well, we only see two or three cases. So this is this is why it's important. As soon as you guys find a problem, send it to Power School because typically the way they work, if they only see two or three tickets, they're thinking it's just a, an isolated issue. But once they see 20, 30, 50 tickets, they know it's a statewide problem and they get on it quicker. So as of yesterday, there were only 11 cases and I know good and well that from what I've seen in the in the details of those tickets, this is global. So if you have issues with GDV, please go ahead and submit a ticket only so that PowerSchool sees that it's a statewide issue. Um, from the description or the details in the cases that have been submitted already, it looks like the majority of the problems are with the summer grads. I have told PowerSchool to have their support staff not advise you to falsify dates for now. I know we've had to do this in the past, but I would prefer that PowerSchool find the problem and fix it in the code. And they've already told us that if they can fix it, there's gonna be an escalation release. So rather than having you guys go in there and backdate um, a graduate, or an exit date. I'd prefer to leave it alone for now and let PowerSchool figure out the problem, get it fixed in the code, and then we'll we'll escalate that release. Um, we have already talked to them about changing the submission dates in the dashboard so that um, that we have a little more time to to resolve this issue. But for now, if you've got problems and if you don't know, then go ahead and run it and and submit the cases if you have problems after you run it, but but don't change the dates. And if you've already done that, I will ask you to go back and change that. Maybe not right now, but as soon as we put out a memo saying that it's been fixed, then I would prefer to see accurate dates than, than false information. And we're supposed to hear more about this today, hopefully by four o'clock. So we'll get an update out to the field once we hear back from Power School. Were we given directions on graduating seniors for summer school? We did put that out, right, Tessa? I am not sure. I believe it's in the summer school grad QRD, correct? Pretty is it, sure it is. Is it for students that were not, that did not complete the year with them and then came back and completed summer school? As long as they were there in the 2021 year, it would be treated just like a summer grad. So you would still follow those QRD, that, that QRD um, to update their previous enrollment record with the correct information and then transfer them out and enter all the, the other details that you need to enter. So you would just follow the same. You don't need to change any of their dates. And Whose again, question were you in? What? Oh. Whose question were you in? Um, I was answering the one that asked, how do we enroll a student that was not with us last semester, but attended summer school and recovered classes to graduate? Someone's asking summer grads were counted in, I thought summer grads were counted in 21-22. Um, this year there was an extension. 
So if you have graduates who attended the 2021 school year and came back for summer and graduated before August 6th, they will be counted in the current year cohort or in the 2021 cohort and on the final GDV due to that extension. So this year is an exception to the normal role, rules. Mm, based on the questions, let us put together a communication with the QRDs that are existing and send that out to everybody. Yeah, so I see some questions about do we enroll them again? You shouldn't have to enroll them again because you're going to transfer them out anyways. Um, so you, you might need to flip the status to create a new enrollment record. I can't remember, but um, yeah. The re -enroll. The, no, I don't think you need to re-enroll them. You just need to use the student field value to create a new enrollment record. Um, but they're going to be transferred out anyways. So let us take these questions that you have. So keep keep putting the questions in if you have them. Um, but we'll take those and we'll make an FAQ and see if we can get some instructions on how to do that for you. Um, but first, we need to get the GDV fixed. <laughs> so it reports correctly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no Somebody matter what about you do, August it's not eight. Yeah. Seniors do have until August 6th to graduate. And we're hoping we know by the end of the day today about this issue. Yep. And Melinda says summer grads don't move to the graduated school until EOI. So how do we do that? That's correct. Um, if you review the QRD that we were referring to, it specifically tells you not to move them and they should still report. Um, but like we said, the GDV has an issue right now with these summer grads that we need to get fixed. So they're not reporting correctly. Uh, once that is fixed, um, using the proper instructions, you should have them report correctly. So any of the grads that you are entering now after July 1st, after EOI was run for July 1st and 2nd, um, you would you would leave them in the school transferred out until the next EOI, which will then move them to the graduated student school. But this should not affect them reporting on the GDV. Um, but that part does not appear to be working correctly, so they are not reporting, but you should leave them transferred out with a W6 code. All right, we'll get a communication out on that. Next slide. Um, <laughs> So we put this in here just to let you know that we we are aware that there were issues. Um, the Eddy feed was disabled prior to EOI, and I enabled it again on July 14th. Um, and then we started getting a lot of tickets saying that the thinking wasn't taking place. You weren't seeing the schools or the new grade levels. So we we sent that over to Power School, and we found out that it was actually a I forget it was like a test duplicate test in the enterprise controller but this is not the first time this has happened and i think in the past we had a duplicate course code or something anything that's duplicated just for some reason doesn't allow the feed to work properly so that's been resolved but i did want to share with you guys that we do have a plan and we're going to get it in the works to where we never have to uh, disable eddie and we're hoping that this can be done before eoi of next year so if we can make that happen, then we'll no longer have these eddy issues. But this was just for information only. All right, so our, our friends in the TIMS department asked me to share this with you guys. Um, I think at, at the beginning, after EOI for the schools that started earlier, we had some folks that were running, who were running that old TIMS extract that was looking at the old NC student contacts, so there was some confusion there. I've had PowerSchool remove that, so the old TIMS extract is not there anymore. I just put this in here as a reminder. There are two links there. One is to a user guide that I think Tessa put together. The second one is a video reference that Lorenzo recorded. It's out there on YouTube. In case you don't know how to extract the TIMS data through Data Export Manager, these links should help you out. Um, and then lastly, I was asked to remind you, if you're using a third-party enrollment system, you need to make sure that that system is accepting the data exactly how TIMS needs to pull it. So it needs to be in the same format that Tim, TIMS is expecting it in. I think they're, they're having issues where, I don't have examples right off, but 
somehow addresses are being entered in a format that Tim's doesn't recognize. And I put Kevin's contact information there in case you are using a third party system um, and you want to get the format that's expected. You can just shoot him an email and he'll respond back with with the issues we've seen and what's expected. Okay, summer school special programs. So I've heard from a lot of you that you were waiting until after summer school ended to go in and put these start and end dates and assign the special programs. We actually need this to be put in there ASAP. And put up at the top, those three special programs are the only summer school special programs you should be using. So um, if you're using something else that was locally created, I need you to go in and change it to the appropriate special program that's DPI approved. So we've got the NC Summer School Extension Program, which is the, um, this is the part that was tied to legislation that extended the school year for students who needed to come back. Um, the, the second one there, local PSU Summer School, this is just your regular summer school that you would have used last year or the years prior um, outside of the extension need. And then you've got the RTA Read to Achieve Summer School Program. Um, so if you've got kids that are attending or did attend, those need to be flagged with one of those three special programs as soon as possible. And then that last item there, the program starting end date should be a true reflection of the student's summer term period. So if they started on July 7th and got out July 29th, those are the dates you need attached to that special program. Good question. Do the start and end dates for the special programs have to be changed if the student quit before the end date? Um, I would say yes. I'll let Rob correct me if I'm wrong, but each student start and end date, just, it, it won't be the same. So if you offered summer school from July 7th through August 7th, um, if a kid only attended partial part of that period, then the start and end date needs to reflect the student's attendance, not the term that you offered it. Am All I right, right there, Rob? Yeah, good answer. Thanks, sir. All right, next slide. And this is where I'm going to turn it over to Rob. I just want everybody to know we are still working on the request we have. If you do have a request, please enter a ticket into service now. Uh, we are continuing to work through the process. We are getting closer, um, and I'm going to report back when I have information. Anything else? I know that it is not exactly the fastest process in the world, but we are truly trying to streamline it and figure it out so that we can make it that way. So please continue putting in those requests as a third-party data integration request. I've reached out to several of you to get me some information from the vendors so that we are working so you know that I am working to get this resolved. Um, it just takes a little bit of time as we work through some of the, the intricacies of data integration. Um, I'm sure you have lots of questions. Please email me them. Uh, it's probably the best way to handle these specifically. And thank you for your patience. All right, going back to the summer school stuff, um, Rob, do we have a drop dead date that the information has to be submitted? For which, sir? Sorry. Special program starting end date. Do we have a date that they need it in by? It would be good to have that done as soon as possible because we're already getting requests about those special programs. If we're just sending data to a third party vendor, does that have to be approved? I am actually working on getting an answer to that very question. Does the attendance spreadsheet have to be returned to DPI or was it just for internal use? That was from That's the Office question. of Learning Recovery. Um, Amy Powell Moman is the contact for that. I'm gonna drop her email in the chat. Kate said it has to be returned for to DPI for K-8 students only. That's good to know. Grade level negative nine is not shown for my high schools after EOI. Do I need to have this added to Eddie again? I'm not sure why that would have disappeared after EOI, except for there were a handful of districts that I had to contact at the end of the year because there were some issues in other systems where grade level negative nine was in your, in your school, but not being used. And I was told that if it's not being used and there are no students in there, I forget if it was ECATS, there was another system that it was causing problems in. 
So I had to call some folks and have them remove that negative nine. So if you're not using it, there's no need for it to be there. But if you are using it, then yes, that needs to be added to Eddie. Okay, Mark shared with me, it looks like Amy told him that October 30th was when the attendance needs to be submitted. So I'll get with Amy and we'll get a communication out so that everybody's aware. I'm not sure where her communications are going. Um, so we're down to 50 minutes. I think we're good on time. I'm going to turn it over to Russell, Tessa, and John for some upgrade information, but I do want to share first that we are on target to move this release into production on the weekend of August 6th. So that is still our plan. Um, I think we have a backup plan for September, but I don't even want to talk about it because I'm hoping we can hit this target date. I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you. And yeah, you can I start real quick while you guys are shifting that just a little bit? Sure. Um, I do want to say that um, what wording that I have often used for people, just so you're aware on this call, I believe power school is a team sport. Um, I believe it's a team sport because of all its intricacies and what it is out there. And I believe we have a great team here at DPI. Many of you know Russell. Uh, I think Justin leads the way very well. I think Tessa and John jump in and help and do their everything. And many of you know Russell. Russell was out there with us many years. And then he retired, I believe. And then came here and he has really led this effort to upgrade power school. And I want to give him a huge round of applause for the work that he has done to help this effort and lead it and keep it on track. So Russell, I just wanted to thank you uh, for what you have done for this. I know you were a huge asset out in the field and you've been very good here. So thank you very much, Russell. Well, I appreciate that. Hopefully I'm sharing the correct screen. You should be seeing the the green power school upgrades. Uh, okay, I'm going to move to the next slide. Can you see the next slide? Incident yeah. action type attendance. Yeah, we're yeah. good. Thank you. All right. So one of the upgrades that we're dealing with this time is we are going to be able to get rid of the customization which required OSS and ISS to automatically put the attendance in the student's record. That customization is gone because a new core product is taking its place. So I'm going to go through a few of the things that you have to do or that DPI is going to do for you to make this work. First of all, on the prefaces screen, and I'm going to just move away from the slide and just show you, on the prefaces screen in each of the schools, you must go in and check two boxes at the bottom of the screen on prefaces. You have to check the enable writing attendance from incident actions and restrict attendance codes to mapped incident action codes. DPI will be pushing that down to each of your schools so that they will be automatically checked and you will not need to do that. The other setup you have to complete in order to make this work is there's a new option under attendance called action, attendance action code mapping. And what we have to do is to map the attendance code to the action type. And basically the way that works is you don't apply to all subcodes, you choose each one of your attendance codes and choose the action type that's mapped to that. Once again, DPI is pushing that out, so you will not need to do that. That's all going to be taken care of for you. As I've already told you that we're going to be pushing down those items for you. When you actually create an action to assign to a student, if it has attendance such as ISS or OSS attached to it, you will see the screen printout that you see on your uh, screen right now. It will tell you attendance entry enabled for this action. The reason I put this particular screen print here is that sometimes people are needing to enter 5.3, 5.2, 5.4, 
or the assigned duration. And because of that, we have had this fixed so that if you enter 5.3, it will round up your end date automatically. So that in this case, 5.3 would give you six days. So it will automatically give you six days for the begin date to end date. The reason given for this is that sometimes a student is not going to be considered to be on ISS or ISS the whole day. It's only partial. So that's why this was put in place. Once you've chosen an OSS or an ISS action, it will automatically create what you see on the bottom of the screen, which is a place for the attendance. And I'm going to go in to uh, the live screen to show you that. Just remember, I'm in a training environment, so everything's not exactly the same. Now, I will tell you that currently we're having problems with the loading showing up and not going away when you go to the student first and then do the incident. That is being worked on. Sometimes you can, can refresh your screen and that will take care of the issue. Sometimes it doesn't. So I'm going to go through incident management at the start page. And I've created an incident for us to take a look at. But it's not showing what it should be showing. Okay, let me go back. Well, it's showing it a while ago. It's not showing it any longer. I'll just go back to our slides. So it shows what you see at the bottom. What you will see is action, begin date, end date, duration code, assign duration, actual duration and attendance listed at the bottom of your screen. It will, the duration code will show you if it's a long term or short term, how many days they were assigned, uh, the duration and the actual duration. And then we have the pencils. In order for the attendance to go into the student's attendance record, you must set the attendance and that must be done by clicking on the pencil. We have added an alert with this screen at the bottom that says important, attendance must be set for each offender in the table above by clicking the edit pencil or pencils. If you only have one person, you only have to click one pencil, of course. For fighting, you normally have two, so you must click each of the pencils before you submit the incident. We've also put in a, a fail safe that will not allow you to have the submit incident button until you have clicked the pencils. Once you click the pencil, you'll see a screen similar to the one that you see on this slide. It will give you, if it is a meeting attendance school, it will list each of the periods the student is in. And then at the top of that screen in the middle, you'll see set for all attendance or set all for range. You click on that, it will set the attendance code for all of the periods for that date range. You will notice on Friday that that particular screen or particular column is gray. That's because that is not in the date range and it will not allow you to enter attendance from the screen on Friday since it is not included in the date range that we're dealing with. You'll also notice that I have gone in on Tuesday and removed the absence code for the first period and the second period because the student was not suspended and given OSS and it did not start until period number three. So on period three and period four, you will notice that we have our attendance codes there. Once you've finished, make sure you click OK. And once you've gone out, 
going back out, make sure you click submit. That's pretty much all there is as, as far as the incident action type attendance. At the bottom of this screen, you'll notice that there is a, it says you can find more information concerning incident action type attendance by clicking here. So if you click on the word here, it will take you to the release notes that explain incident action type attendance uh, in more detail. John, did you want to take over for this or you want me to skip these and. Can, can you go back one second, Russell? Yes. I just want to make sure that people understand. Can you go back one more slide? You might have to yes. go back a couple to um, write. No, keep going back. No, to the settings and the setup is what I'm looking at. Okay. There it is. Perfect. I just want to make sure that everyone heard something that Russell said. We're actually working um, right now to get these changes. One of the reasons, one of the things I think we need to do better from a DPI perspective is inform you of these things that work um, from the DPI level, just like Justin gave a, a great um, summation of what the enterprise controller is. So that when we tell you things like I'm getting ready to, um, that it will work. I just wanna make sure that everybody caught, we are planning on having this pushed down, this setting pushed down from the enterprise controller and the mapping pushed down from the enterprise controller. So that is something that you will not have to do or worry about. And we are having that done before the upgrade goes out so that when you start Monday morning in a perfect world with the upgrade, all of this will already be set up for you. Did I say that correctly, Russell and Justin? Yes. Okay. So, but I just wanna make sure everybody knows that you don't have to go in and do anything. Now, if you wanna go in and look at it to make sure it did it right, that's how you do it. But we are planning on having this pushed out before you get to business on Monday morning. Thank you, Russell, for going back that far. Sure. John, were there any questions that we needed to address right now? Um. Yes, so we did get a handful about Educator's Handbook, and I did answer those in the chat, but Educator's Handbook should still function the same. The person importing the incident from Educator's Handbook, you know, it pops up each incident on the PowerSchool side, will need to hit that edit pencil and do the attendance before they can actually submit it within PowerSchool. Um, and then there was a question I saw that I'm not sure of. I don't know if you know, Russell. Um, do we need to update security rules for staff who enter incidents to allow them to also be able to update attendance? I'm not aware off the top of my head of needing to make any changes. The option should be there for them to be able to do that because they're able to use the incident page. However, we will try to find an answer to that and let you cool. know if it's anything different. Yeah, I think we can test that. Um, and then another one, when it auto calculates that end date for the duration, is it taking into account school holidays? Like, is that looking at the school calendar or is it just math on the dates? It should work the very same way that it currently works in production. So if Perfect. it works that way in production right now, it should work that way when we do the upgrade, because the incident page uses the customizations that we have put in. These are not the same as the attendance customizations, but it should use the same customizations we've already applied to the incident page previously. Cool. Um, we had a request for a repeat about Educator's Handbook. So Educator's Handbook should still work fine but the person importing each incident will need to hit that edit pencil on the PowerSchool side before they hit submit on each incident. Um, and we had a question come in about ABE. I am not familiar with that system. Um, so if you want to email us or we, we can try to find an answer to that. Um, and someone asked if there's a video or QRD being worked on, there will be um, documentation with that um i believe we'll be able to send you some core documentation on that actually yes the core documentation is right here on the screen where you click the word here it's the release ah. notes and explains how to do incident action type attendance hey Perfect. john did you did you want to hit the next one or do you want me to skip those and let you come back to those 
Um, why don't you skip those and then I'll come back and just do all of my demo at once. Um, and Brenda, your question about teacher portal educators handbook, I will answer that when I do my demo on it. Okay, here is an option that all of you have been looking for a, a function change history. Change history is here. Uh, so change history will, will provide you with the ability to track changes. It also tracks changes if you look at the second bullet, changes where they're done by the user through the user interface, import, API, et cetera. I think that's great. And what it will do is it will give you the username, the date, the time, IP address, all of that information. Now there is setup required for change history. And change history also requires you to create a security role because you cannot access change history if you do not have that security role. In order to enable change history, you must go and follow this path. Let me see if I can do that in our in this live instance over here. So if you'll bear with me just a minute. So we're going to go to uh, system over here under setup. We want to go to system settings. And then we have change history settings. This part of the setup involves you turning it on. And you also choose, have to choose which items you want to provide change history for by putting a check mark beside it. That's part of the setup you must do. And of course, click submit once you've completed that particular item. Now, you also, as I said, you have to create a security role. So under system administrator, roles administration, user access, you create, click on your course, and you create a change history role. Now, you will probably want to create more than one of these. The change history role I've created here in this system gives the person access to every one of those items that we have change history for. You may not want someone to be able to see change history for every single item. So you may want to create additional roles other than the one that I've created here in my screen. First thing you do, of course, is in the definition, you give it a name, give it a description if you'd like to, and you enable it. Under the change history tab, you choose the settings, you can view change history, and then you choose which ones you want them to be able to view. As I said, this role I chose shows every change history option available. Now, I can take some away. So like I said, you may create a role where they can only see changes in demographics. You may want to create one where they can only see changes dealing with attendance or attendance and demographics. That's up to you. Once you've made those changes and created the role, you save the role. Now, in order to be able to access change history, there you can access it if you're on a screen where it allows you to see change history. I'm not changing anything on this page. So I have a student I want to look at. And I'm going to go to the address page in this case. You'll see there's a change history option in the top. Once I click on it, it shows me the date and the time, who changed it, their IP address, 
what the action was with an update, delete, what was it? It shows you what the information was before and what the information was afterwards. So change history is going to show you all of that. Wonderful thing. Personally, I love it. I think it's great. And like I said, based on the ones you've given out and uh, that you've checked for change history, demographics will show you change history. However, right now I don't believe I have any unless it shows me the address bar. Okay, on demographics, it can show me where I changed the address. Now you also notice there's another date down here. I click on that date. It's telling me change by public portal, update. The legal last name, legal first name before it says after it says this. I'm not sure what changed on that. But as I said, it gave me another date showing me that a change had been made. You would see the same thing on historical grades. However, this student and these students don't have any historical grades. If they did, you could do change history and you would see those changes. I'm going to forward through the slides. At the bottom of this slide, you will notice it says click here. If you click here, it will take you once again to the release notes. It will explain how to set up change history, how change history works, what you can see, uh, because you also have an option where you can see the change history for everybody in one location. And those release notes explain how you would do that. John, any questions we need to look at right now? Um, just a few. Um, if they're so like for say incidents, if the default security group for the user doesn't have rights to the incidents page, but they have a role that gives them access to change history for incidents, can they see that change history even though they can't get to the incidents page? I'm thinking that would be a no. I would think that would be a no. We can check on it, but I would think that would be a no. Because um, that, that's where your change history option is. That's where you click on it is on that page. And if they don't have the security role, will they see that change history link at all? I'm thinking that's also a no. They won't see it if they don't have you, the role. You see, right. You see no change history roles if you don't have that. I mean, if you don't have that role, you see you're not able to access change history. Uh, do we know how far back it can show changes? Is there like a limit on the number of changes I, that will show? Got to look at that. I want to say from the point forward, once you turn it on, I don't think it goes back in the past. I think it starts when you turn it on, but I'll have to look at that. No, you're correct, Russell. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it looks like the last one is, and this is a great point. It mentioned in a power school video, we need to turn change history off before storing grades so that the change history log doesn't get too crazy. Correct. Um, and yes, that is a great point, and we will make sure that that is mentioned uh, when we send this stuff out. Yes, that's one of those I forgot to mention, but you are totally correct, because you would probably never be able to do anything if you did that. All right, anything else before we move to the next one? I believe we're good to move ahead. There's not a way to automate that, that turn off at this point, um, Connie asked. But we can Not certainly look at that. We'll mention it. Okay, moving on to the next one. You can now create a, attendance admit slips when you enter a student's attendance. So I put a lot of information on this particular screen, and I'm going to actually show you one that's been created and probably show you how to create one. But you can now create an attendance slip. If you use clock in, clock out, it'll put that information on there as well. Uh, so for some people, that will be a really great feature. For some of you, it may not. I'll slow, show you the slide first, and then I'll, I'll show you that. But we actually go to the meeting attendance screen. You click the check, check box for print admit slip for today. And by the way, it will only print an admit slip for the current date. You cannot go back to the past and print one. It will only print it for the current date. You'll notice that I've used a high school admit slip. And this person checked in at 829 AM. 
during that particular period with a code of 2L. And they just happen to have two, period, two classes listed there. And then they checked out at 115. Shows you the date, student, who the person was that put the information in, gives you a place for the parent or teacher to sign or date. So let's go over here. I have an example. So I'm bringing up David Castillo, and I am going to go to inner attendance. I'm going to choose to print and mid slip for today. Now, I put a code 1B in here because what I'm planning to do is I'm going to do clock in, clock out. I'm going to clock the student in at 853. Now I need to show I need to show you a little bit of of more setup on the preferences page in just a minute that deals with clock in clock out, especially with meeting attendance. It tells you automatically students miss 33 minutes at the beginning of the scheduled period. A tardy attendance code is recommended. So I'm going to go ahead and give them a, an attendance code of 2L. I could fill it to subsequent periods if I chose. I'm not because I don't need it. I am going to lock out this student at 1256. Students missed 49 minutes of the scheduled period and absent attendance code is recommended. So I'm going to use a 2A, save that. So we've got a, we've got a 1B because the student was sick first period, or or at a, I'm sorry at an appointment. Then they came in tardy, they were there that period, and then they checked out early at the end of the day, missing uh, enough to be counted absent. Once I click submit, it brings up my admit slip. It brings up my admit slip, and there's the information. And once again, at the bottom of that, you have the place for the parent or teacher to sign the date, shows you the date that it was done, what time it was done, and all the information you need. Before I leave the screen, does anyone have any questions about this? I haven't seen any come in on that. Okay, one other thing I did want to show you very quickly is on the start page and on the preferences page under attendance under clock in clock out there's a se section where you can set the thresholds for tardy it can be minutes or percentage and the threshold for an absent for the clock in, clock out. And I said mine based on 43 minutes or 46 minutes. What I looked at is I looked at the length of the period and then put the amount of minutes that should uh, be, should, should show you zaps for over half of the period. Or you could do it as a percent. That's to be up to you. Okay, anything else? If not, I'm done. A couple questions came in there. Um, is there an interface that allows students to do a clock in, clock out from the front office? Not students themselves, no. Mm -hmm. um, but this would be your front office staff doing this, likely. Um, and someone asked, "What does this work the same in a daily attendance school? Um, you know, it'll probably look a little bit different with the daily attendance screen, but this all works in daily attendance schools? Yes, it just looks a little different. 
Anything else? Perfect. Um, I think that's it. Um, and I, I will say just real quick before we move on, um, in re regards to that question about automating turning off change history before storing grades, um, if that person can put that in as an enhancement request in PowerSchool community, since that's core functionality, then all of us in North Carolina and PowerSchool users across the world can plus one it and, and hopefully get that done that way. Um, I would like to say, kind of as we shift, we understand that the time is getting short. I told you that we would probably maybe run a little long today. So we may, and if we do, the meeting will not end. We encourage you to stay because obviously we're giving you information on the upgrade and items that will be coming very soon. Um, and so just know if it runs over 12, we will continue and we hope you can stay with us and you are finding this beneficial. Thank you. Yes, I forgot to mention that uh, the enhanced DDE plugin that some of you have will be removed because it creates a string key was not found error on the DDE and DDA screens. Power tools will be upgraded for those of you who don't have already at 5.0.8. You will upgrade there. We have to put in another little plugin for power tools. It's called the Hotec Power Tools Fix for 20.4, or your power tools doesn't work. We're not doing the enhanced health module at this time because we need to discuss some items with the business owners. Plus, there are a lot of code sets that need to be created. So your health, your health module will be, will be just as it is in production currently. After the upgrade, if you receive an error, unknown error while rendering page, please submit a ticket to Virus School. This error is caused normally because you've got a customized page and it has some outdated code in it, and that code has to be removed. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to go just a touch off script here, but we did want to show you guys quickly kind of how the new search functions um, in the new version of PowerSchool. So kind of the example I came up with is, especially with compound searches, things are a lot easier. Um, so for example, in the past, let's say you wanted your middle school students who are in band and are boys, maybe. So in the past, you would have had to do this compound search term, combining them with that semicolon, and you can still do that. Um, but I'm going to clear all and kind of show you how much easier this is. So now we can kind of just stack these searches. So we'll start with our grade level then I could add the gender equals M to that. And you can see it sort of starts stacking those different search terms here. And then I can add my band. And what's nice is by doing this now, let's say I wanted to get rid of that gender filter. I can do that. Now I've got all middle school students who are in band. I could get rid of the grade level. Now I've got all students in the district who are in band. Um, so just sort of a quick quick demo of that new search. Um, are there any questions on that? Or from my team, anything on that I should cover that would I you, didn't? Would you click on the students drop down? Oh, yes, good point. This is also where the staff and contact search has moved. And then also click on the all. So you can change kind of what you're searching by. You could do staff type, teachers. And you should be able to stack these here as well. There we go. So all teachers with the first name of Michael. And again, you can Yoink some of those off, so now all staff with the first name of Michael. And ditto too then for contacts. Any questions on that? So 
So uh, I'll say I really like that personally. Um, so next up then was teacher incidents. Um, so I'm going to show you first where you would John, turn that on from the district level. And then John, we'll, yes, go we, ahead. Can we address one question? Absolutely. Um, one question that I see come in there is the multi-select is not showing here. And the multi-select is not showing here probably because that plugin is not in this training instance he has. We have no intention of taking that away. And please remember that is not a state plugin. I don't believe the state has pushed that out. That is a third party plugin that you have put into your instance. So um, we are not planning on taking that away. The only um, I used it every day when I put it in. So um, I just want everyone to know we did not push out multi select. That is something that has just kind of grown over the years. So please remember that when we're talking about items we've done, and then you all have probably done some things, we just need to make sure that you understand that that one is not ours. And did I miss anything? I was just going to say to add to that, do know that it is a plugin. So if we upgrade and it is not working, you need to go check the status of that plugin and make sure you have the most up to date one. Um, but also check the status of it from where you got it from. I, I believe it's on the exchange um, and make sure that it does function with the new upgrade. And I was going to say that is a warning. And I played in those plugins just as much as anybody else. Anybody who knows me knows I played in those plugins. When upgrades occur, you need to check all of them because what we have found and I have learned since I've been up here is a small plugin can wreak a lot of damage. So you would want to check them if things don't look right before submitting a ticket. Check your plugins, make sure that they are not causing the error um, before you do a ticket. Um, and I think another question came up while I'm on this conversation about someone other than educators handbook with the incident module. It is always best if you have a third party vendor. To check with that third party vendor, because you can probably get them to them quicker than we can to say we're using your product. Is it going to work with the upgrade? And I understand North Carolina is different. We are working hard to make sure that it is close to core as possible. But that is your best avenue to start. Because we, because we're North Carolina, tend to be slower than everybody else to move to the new versions. Please check with them because they should already have experienced this with other customers and be able to tell you whether it works or not with the versions we are on. Does that make sense to everyone on the call? I hope it does. All right. Thanks, John, for that interlude. No problem. Um, all right. So, and I'm actually going to show you. Two, two admin settings that are new for power teacher and then we'll jump over to the power teacher side so these are both going to be at the lea office level and then lea setup the first one is going to be under district information miscellaneous this is where you can turn on enable incident creation in the teacher portal so that is a checkbox you'll have to turn on. I don't believe we're going to turn this on for you by default. So this is a local decision. If you want it on, you can come turn it on. Um, and you can kind of decide, you know, if you're using Educator's Handbook or another third-party incident system, you can kind of decide if you want this turned on or not. Um, I'll tell you if it were me in a PSU and I was using Educator's Handbook, and all my teachers were used to using Educator's Handbook and we loved it and we were happy with it, I would probably not turn this new feature on. Um, but for those of you who aren't using it, we'll, we'll take a look at it and see what it looks like. The other district setup option I wanna show you real quick is gonna be again back in LEA setup. Um, and then we're gonna scroll down to Power Teacher Pro settings and then default gradebook settings. And so this is where you can turn on displaying the student contacts in PowerTeacher Pro and whether or not they can also see the notes on those contacts in PowerTeacher Pro. Additionally, you can enable their ability to email students and or contacts from PowerTeacher Pro directly. 
and you can choose whether to allow them to contact students from previous years from Power Teacher Pro. So we've got all of these new options enabled in this training database. And so I will jump over to the teacher side and we'll take a look at them real fast. Um, I'll mention the emailing from Power Teacher Pro does use the does use the email settings of your PowerSchool instance, but the email should come from the teacher. John, someone asked um, if using Educator Handbook, then don't turn on which feature. Uh, the entering of incidents from Power Teacher Pro. Um, just because if you're, you know, if your principals are used to getting that text from Educator's Handbook or, or a notification or checking that other third-party system for their referrals, and now all of a sudden a teacher is putting a referral in through PowerSchool instead of the third-party system, it just might not get seen, right? So you'll just want to make sure that you're, you know, clear about where incidents are supposed to go in for your PSU. And there was there's another question. Um, enable incident creation and teacher portal. Can this be done for selective schools? I believe that is a district level setting only. Any other questions before we look at the teacher side? That's it so far. Okay. So for a teacher to enter an incident, it is done from the Power Teacher portal, not Power Teacher Pro. So to do their incident, they'll hit the backpack, they'll select a student, and then they can select their student screen. They'll have a new one called Submit Incident Entry. So they can put in their date and time. They can do a title. And then they can submit that in. And if we jump back over to the admin side and we go to incident management, we'll set our incident element to incident type. And then we can look at our teacher referral incident types. And so you can see that vaping in class referral came in. And we can open that up. And then you would finish filling in this incident um, as you normally would. And you would change the incident type from teacher referral, of course, to discipline is what we use for North Carolina. And then you would complete the rest of the required incident elements and fields and all of that. Um, and then once you submitted that, it would no longer be in the teacher incident bucket. It would just be a regular discipline incident. And that is pretty much all there is to power school or power teacher incident entry. Um, so the teacher really just gets that date, time, title, description. They submit. Then you'll take care of the rest from the admin level, selecting the incident type and all of that other stuff. And and John, I'm going to go ahead. There there have been a lot of people who have been asking if educators handbook. You know, don't turn on what feature, don't do this. I believe what John said was if you use Educator's Handbook, I am not sure I would turn this on. Not that he said to turn it off. I think that that is truly your decision as to what you would do or not do. Is that correct, John? Absolutely, yes. That is that is just my opinion and what I would do. Um, if I were still in the field, um, but of course that's totally up to you. If you use Educator's Handbook and you also want to turn this on, you are certainly welcome and free to do that. But you just want to make sure that the referral is being attempted to either way. Absolutely. Um, and I saw a question pop up here briefly. I can't really see the chat very easily, but I see things randomly pop up. Someone asked, if the teacher gets any follow up on this from their end and no, they do not. They just get to submit the incident entry. And as far as I know, that is all they get. And there was another question. Is the teacher able to view their previous referrals? No, they can just submit. That's all they get. 
Um, but that might be a good enhancement request um, since this is a core feature. Um, and I saw one about notifications. As far as I know, there is also not an admin notification on this feature. Um, anyone on my team correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there's any admin notification. So that might be another good enhancement request. And is again, one reason if you already have educators handbook or another third party that does that notification, um, you might want to stick with that just until, um, that gets added here. I, I think there's a notification and it's set up under the school school info on who it notifies. Oh, let's pick real quick. I want to say there's a discipline. Yeah, there's a disciplinarian that is set up with an email address. It says email copies of new teacher log slash incident oh. referrals to. And that's what John's showing you now. All right. So apologies. It should email notify whatever is put in this box. And that's um that's under the school school info. And if you click on the school, you should be able to update that email there and submit the page. Um, and Francine, we can verify, but I would think you'd be able to comma separate multiple. Yeah, I think all of those email fields you can comma separate. So I'd imagine you should be able to do that here. John's checking now. Well, I can't submit. I'm missing some other field somewhere. All these Eddie fields I'm missing. Oh. But that should work. We can we can test that or check the the documentation more closely and make sure. But it looks like that. That should be an option. Any other questions on um, power teacher incidents? Cool. Someone's asking if PS has office referrals and minor incident. As far as I'm aware, no. Um, you would only have the teacher can only do the the discipline referral. Now they can put in. If you wanted to locally use logs, they can do a log entry. Um, but as far as incidents go, they just get the one teacher referral incident type, which then goes up to admin and follows all the regular discipline reporting requirements from that point. Um, and I just did confirm in one of our DPI 6 instances that you can put multiple email addresses in that field. I didn't get an error or anything. Awesome. Anything else on incidents? All right. So I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about Power Teacher Pro contacts and emails. So the contacts and emails are actually through Power Teacher Pro, not the Power Teacher portal. So we'll flip over to Power Teacher Pro. So first off, we'll look at student contacts. So they'll go to their student's charm. And then demographics, they can select which student they want up here as usual. So they get the student information from the demographics page, but down below that, they also get listed the contacts. And so they can click to expand each contact in the system, and it's just going to show them, you know, exactly what's associated with the student. So if there's a no-name contact, they will see the no-name contact and they can see all of the flags and everything associated with those contacts. So what can they do with that, you might ask, other than just look at it? They can, if you choose to allow them, send emails from PowerTeacher Pro now as well. So to send an email, they'll use the Create Plus at the top right, like they do for an assignment or category. There's now an email option. So that'll pop up this Create Email screen. They can select which class rosters they want to look at, first of all. Um, they could even do all classes if they wanted. And then they can go through, they can check if they want to email students, so they'll check to the left. If they want to email contacts, they'll check to the right. It's only going to list contacts that have an associated email. They can also check at the top on either the left or right to select all students or all contacts. 
once they've made their selections, and I'll point out there's also a copy emails button down here. So if they want to just hit copy emails and paste that into Gmail or Outlook or whatever email client they use, they can do that. Or once they've made their selection, they can flip over to message. They can pop in their subject, a message. They can choose whether or not to carbon copy themselves, and then they can hit send. And that will send the email out. And when parents reply, that reply will go to the teacher's email account. Any questions on emailing from Power Teacher Pro? We have a question. Will emails sent be seen in someone's sent folder in Gmail? That's a good question. I'm thinking through it. I would I would say no because emails that are sent from PowerSchool are initially sent from the PowerSchool server, which I believe you can see when looking at the email settings or the email server in your PowerSchool instance. Um, but then the initial the response would then come in to the teacher's email. Yeah, I'm thinking that's correct. If you if you're using a, a separate SMTP server. It would probably be in the sent box of the account that PowerSchool uses to access your SMTP server rather than the teacher's sent box. And then someone um, said that would be the reason to CC yourself. Absolutely. That's yes. a good idea. Um, and that was, I believe, all that I had on my list for demos. If there aren't any other questions or anything I can show in terms of this. Uh, I see a question. Will teachers receive notifications regarding the updates when they sign on to PT Pro? Uh, yes. So I, I couldn't show you that because I already logged in as this teacher yesterday to practice all of this. Um, but yes, the first time they log in, they'll get this what's new pop up by default um, after the upgrade is installed. And they can exactly. always go to the help button and hit what's new. And Which there's this great video. little video. Yep. <laughs> there you go. I so see people asking about, about videos. So six minute video for what's new for teachers. Um, and I'm sure there's we'll we'll check and see if there's an admin version. I know for the last update there was a teacher video, and I think there was an admin video too. So it's been a while since we've all been together. Of course, we're looking at doing our meetups in person next go round, but I think it would be nice for us to come together and have a conference. Um, so this year we are looking at hosting a fall conference. So we've, we've pulled out of CCES. Um, we've heard for years that you guys want a conference that's just for coordinators. And that's what we're going to offer this fall. The date that we're looking at, we've already got it booked actually, on November 8th through 10th. So the 8th is on a first. We're looking at doing two and a half days of sessions. Uh, we picked this so that because it's, well, go on to the next slide, please. It's going to be at Cape Fear Community College. Um, so that'll give you guys the opportunity if you want to come in early, like that that weekend, you can make a trip of it. And then the following day is a holiday, Veterans Day, so you can you can make a week of it if you want to. So we're hoping you guys can come down. I know it's a long drive for the folks on the east or west side of the state. Um, the space we have is going to hold around 300 people, I think. It could hold a little more, but we'd be pushing it um, if we go much higher than 300. It's got six, actually seven breakout rooms. It's one large room that can be split in half and then five other breakout rooms. So we're going to look at offering at least six sessions, hopefully, at a time. Uh, go on to the next slide. That's just some more pictures. We've not um, We've not put anything together yet. Uh, as far as a call for proposals, but I would like before we wrap up and take questions, if you just take a few minutes and drop in the chat sessions that you would like to see offered, um, we're going to start putting together an agenda and reaching out to some of you to see if you want to help us teach some sessions. Um, the registration fee is still unknown right now. But it, it's definitely going to be affordable. Um, I see a question about is this for coordinators or would it be appropriate for data managers? Um, Rob, what do you think? 
I think this it's one's be coordinator a coordinator focused, I believe. Yeah, this one's coordinator focused. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and answer another question I saw is whether it'll be a spring conference. I think we want to see how this fall conference goes and make sure we do everything we promised we would do. And then if it is well received, we will look at a spring conference. But this is our first attempt at doing this, and we just want to make sure we do it correctly. So we're going to do it small with just coordinators and then spread it out. Um, based on the feedback from this conference, we will then determine next steps for a spring conference or conferences later in the year uh, in 22-23. Does that answer your question? Uh, we will work on that, Christina. That's a great question. Yeah, and it may be that we have to record them and then post them later. So just for those of you who aren't monitoring the chat, Christina asked if there will be a virtual sign-in option for those not comfortable in group settings. We'll work on that. Yeah, good point. So this one is just for coordinators and we will probably we have to look at it and we're very early in working on this. We didn't really get the space or know we had the space till Friday of last week. So we are very early. We're just wanted to give you the dates so you could keep those dates open in your calendar so that you could come. And please, I see one person who's put in suggestions. Please give us more suggestions. We're looking for them. Yep. And it will be a variety of trainers. We're going to have some power school trainers, some folks from DPI, probably reach out to a few of you who have helped us in the past. And like I said, we're still working on pricing and everything. Once we get it approved, DPI um, will put out a registration. All right, that's it. I believe the next slide is just Q&A. I do want to bring up a couple things that I think that we um, need to discuss. One piece is attendance. I can't believe we didn't have a slide on this. Um, so we may have to add it in, in the slides. The one R code is still to be used for any student that is virtual. So if you still have kids, if you're doing blended learning or you have full virtual schools, those students are still present off site and would need that code to be used because the default is present on site. Um, so please know that that has not gone away and I just need everybody to be aware of that. As we start to come back more face to face. I was asked this question and we're going to go ahead and bring it up. There's a question of whether contacts will transfer with this new version. Um, it has long been said that the we'll be able to stop the transferring of contacts. We are investigating that and we are working to determine um, the transfer process and if they will come over. So we will give you an answer to that at a later date. Uh, I'm going I to, I just saw a question I want to look at. Uh, what if we are doing blended really? We are not doing blended really, but a student is sent home and does assignments. Can they be coded as one R? I believe that that is more of a policy question. So if you could email that question to home base, we will work to get you an answer to that question because I see that more as a policy question and I don't want to answer policy. I was going to actually say, Rob, you can email that to schoolbusiness at dpi.nc.gov. There you go. I just want to make sure we get the answer to that too, Tessa, so we need to reach out to them. I'd like to know what that answer is. Um, and I see one out here about investigating the option to select an existing contact when registering a sibling so it doesn't create a duplicate. Um, I think that might be another enhancement request in PowerSchool community, since that is a mostly core process, I think, isn't it, Tessa? So, Sorry, what was the question? Uh, so when you enroll a sibling, an option to select the existing contacts so it doesn't create duplicates based off of the demographics. Selecting a sibling to attach them to the enrolled student is core. Yes. Yeah, so I think that would be an enhancement request likely. Yeah. 
Anything with contacts at this point is now core functionality. Um, we got one on calendar setup. If we have an occasionally blended or remote situation, should our calendar day type reflect that or just be in session? I would say your calendar day should reflect the type of instruction happening in that school that day. Um, and do we need the number of minutes in the calendar notes field for each day? Um, I think that was only for remote days, as I recall. What was that question, John, one more time? Do we need to enter the number of instructional minutes in the note field for each day in calendar setup? Um, but I believe that was just for those remote days correct. that you were entering the minutes. I believe that's correct, yes, sir. And there was a question about GPAA on the historical grade screen um, with issues entering P or F. Um, we're aware. We need to take this back to look at it, um, but we are aware of that issue right now. Perfect. Um, and another calendar setup question. If we're face to face, but we ha do have a handful of students remote in that school, would we use blended or in session? So, yes, if you have some of your students in a school or remote and some students are in person, I believe that would be a blended calendar day type. For that particular day. And that, I see a question about the SASA manual. SASA manual is updated by school business um, division. You can email them with your questions. Absolutely. Um, I see one about attendance codes with the sort order and teacher assign that should be fixed now, I believe, um, where you can edit the sort order and teacher assign values and have it stick. Is that right, Justin? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. It should be. For GPAA, do we, do we still need to add the course to the catalog for it to show in the drop down on historical grades page? I. I don't believe so. That was not the original intention. Um, but as we said earlier, it doesn't appear to be functioning as it was when we passed it in QA. So we'll have to we'll have to take that back and find out. Um, but initially, no, it should not have to be added. It should just pull from the course catalog in the enterprise controller. Um, are we doing teacher in field out of field this year? We think so. That's still being tested. Um, and I see one about the 1 R code instructions for students in person and classrooms being sent home due to multiple positive cases. I think that might be more of a policy thing, but we can take that back. Yeah, I would say email school business about that. Um, any update on with new withdrawal codes? I think we mentioned that at 1 point. We talked about it, but I think there needs to be more conversations internally. Gotcha. That is something we'd like to do. Let's see. I see one about editing contacts in the data export manager, data import manager. I believe that would also be a core functionality. Um, so I would suggest reaching out to PowerSchool support or putting in an enhancement request in the community. Um, any news on the AMC state report? I've not heard of anything. Um, I am going to go ahead and, and flip to the last slide here just so you can get our feedback link. Um, and I, I'll keep going questions until somebody stops me. <laughs> um, we got one about the individual student report in the parent portal. Um, I believe that's a pilot program right now, right? So I think every PSU will see the link in the parent portal, but only those who are part of the pilot will actually have the ISR populated. That is correct. And I, I actually talked to accountability about that. Hopefully that will become more um, used by the end of the year this year. Rob, do you care to go in detail and share with them what that is for the folks that don't know? No, I don't have any any issue. Thank you. I should have done that. The individual student report are reports that they receive after um, 
they have to, a parent has to be sent home the individual student report within 30 days after a student completes the test so the parent can be notified of how well their student has done on the test. These individual student reports are usually, uh, there are two copies, one's usually kept in the QM folder and one is sent home. In this case, uh, what was asked probably two, three years ago was, can we put that in PowerSchool? The answer to the question is yes. What we have done is made it so there is a link in the parent portal. And once testing is complete, a parent will be able to log into the web portal, not the app, click on that link, and then that link will pop up and have um, the ability uh, to see the ISR without having to have one sent home. Any more questions on that? Um, I see one. So do we still have to print the ISR and send to students? If you're not in the pilot, you would still be providing the printed reports. Um, but I think that's the intent of, of this pilot is so that parents can just get it through the parent portal instead. And, and then again, we are not the business owners of the ISR. So that question also is good to go through accountability to answer that question. And the regional accountability coordinator should be able to assist through answering any questions about those. Perfect. Um, and is that, this this ISR pilot stuff in writing anywhere on the DPI site yet? I do not know. Again, I'd have to work through that through, we've not advertised it whole because of the fact that it is strictly a pilot program. We just had to inform you about that link because we wanted to make sure if you got questions, you knew what was going on. Oh, and perfect. I, just, I think yeah. Tessa, yep. Yeah, I just dropped the individual student report DPI link on um, in the chat. Beautiful. Um, and do coordinators need to do anything from the power school side for that ISR? Um, no. I think DPI is going to load all of that, right? Yes, sorry, that's correct. I, it took me a while to get to my mute button. Yes, that's correct. You will have to do nothing on a power school side. You just need to know that link is there. Once it becomes from pilot stage to actually being implemented statewide, we will let you know um, via an announcement that ISRs are available here, but right now it is just in pilot phase, but you will have to do nothing on your end. Perfect. Um, we got one about documentation and student cumulative folders, um, trying to clean them up before they microfilm. Uh, that's, I think that's going to be a question for yeah, school I, business. Or and I might have, that's DTR. probably accountability. That's probably my fault. That's from back in my days when I was a test coordinator. That's what I did in my district. So definitely check with your regional accountability coordinator. And your LEA test coordinator. Perfect. I think we are caught up up to this point. Um, I'll mention at the top right of this slide that's up right now, we have our feedback link for you to provide us feedback on this home base meetup. Please complete that form when you have a moment. At the end of the form, you can optionally choose to provide your information and it will send you a certificate of participation for today with 0.1 CEUs. Um, and I see a question about the meeting recording. Um, so we have been recording today, and we will get this recording out as soon as we possibly can. Um, hopefully by Friday in our bulletin, but if not, early next week. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And like I said in the chat, if you have ideas for sessions for the conference, just shoot them to the home base team. Thanks for joining.